uh, welcome to part four of four uh, on the of the series on Richard Pryor's *The Skeptic and the Dogmatist*. This last video just covers um, the argument in favor of um, skeptical, sorry, in favor of perceptual dogmatism against the skeptic. So um, that's all I'm going to cover. Uh, just a very brief recap: perceptual dogmatism is the view that. Um, the justificatory force of perception doesn't depend on your being justified in believing anything else. Um, and this specifically has the anti-skeptical punch um, against the skeptic, the perceptual justification skeptic who says, in order to be justified in, in believing that you have a hand on the basis of your perception of it, you have to antecedently have a justification for ruling out the possibility that you're being deceived by a demon or that you're dreaming and antecedently there means you can't depend on your perceptions to do it so the perceptual dogmatist um, is a is a sort of in support of ge moore and says you can be justified in believing that you have hands just on the basis of experience as of having a hand so so that's where we're at so now what i want to do is tell you why we're supposed to according to prior what's the reason why we should believe this so the the argument he gives is is basically just it's intuitively the right view <laughs> so that might not sound like a great argument it's intuitively right um so i'm going to try to say i'm going to try to spell out the argument in a little bit more detail and, and try to give it some uh, defense so prior says when somebody asks you when the skeptic asks you uh, what's your grounds for believing that you've got hands um, what Pryor wants to say is the right answer to that question is, well, it just seems like I have hands, perceptually. But he also says, um, it also just seems like the mere fact that one has a, an experience of this kind is enough uh, to count as justification. So what he's saying is, it, it just seems intuitively obvious to him that um, having an experience of this kind should make you justified. And I think it's important to remember here, we're not talking about truth, just justification. So um, we could return to the um, plastic guy on the Candyland board. In an earlier video, I said, imagine that this little plastic character on the board is actually having experiences on the Candyland board, but his experiences look like um, to, from the inside that he's in the licorice lagoon or the peppermint forest or whatever it might be Or in this case, I'm at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Cambridge I'm walking around the grounds um, So in the case of the plastic guy We're we're imagining that he really is deceived He's not actually in the licorice lagoon. He's on this uh, board um, But he's having all these experiences as of being in the Licorice Lagoon. Likewise, I'm having all these experiences uh, of being at the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, so the point here, the intuitive point, is that even if the plastic man is de deceived, he actually doesn't have knowledge because he doesn't have true beliefs. His beliefs are false about where he is. But he at least seems to be justified in believing that he's in the lagoon. After all, he's having all these robust experiences that seem that sort of paint the picture as if he's in the lagoon. Likewise, I am having experiences that say that I'm, you know, standing next to this shrub or whatever. And so my experiences of this thing, the intuitive idea that 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 um, Pryor is trying to get at, is that that my experience of this is enough to make it rational for me to believe that it's there. Even if it's not there, even if, it, if the perception were false, I would still be justified in believing that it's there. Likewise, that I'm standing in front of a building. So now, let's just imagine that I am, in fact, a brain in a vat this time. So in the last video, or two videos ago, I was saying, let's, let's presuppose that my, my beliefs are veridical and that they're true, just asking whether or not they count as knowledge or justified. Now I just want to, to postulate that I'm actually deceived in this right now. So <clears throat> I'm not really at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, not really in front of any plants. Maybe I don't even have a body, but it sure seems like I should be justified. It's not irrational for me to believe that I'm here, given that I'm having experience of these things. So that's the intuitive view. The idea is 
intuitively speaking, just having an experience like this is enough to get us some justification for believing the things that we seem to see. All right, uh, one more example, because I love the footage of these, this flowery tree. Um, when you're having an experience of this, this is your visual experience right now. This experience gives you justification for thinking there are flowers in front of you. This experience is just a kaleidoscopic swirl of colors, maybe a little flowery, but it doesn't give you any intrinsic justification. It's not a picture of anything. But this experience is an image of a tree in front of my face, flowering tree. And that image is a source of evidence. So even in the scenario where I'm being deceived, I'm uh, being fed these images, I'm really a brain in a vat or I'm a deceived soul by a demon. Um, the, the experiences that I'm going through make it rational for me to think that there's a tree with flowers that I'm looking at, um, even if I'm wrong. The justification is just intrinsic to the experience itself, at least prima facie justification. So that's supposed to be the, I'm, I've tried to hopefully convey the sense in which it's an intuitive view. And then Pryor's argument is more or less, hey, let's take these intuitions at face value. Let's just trust, let's say those intuitions are important. They give us a good reason to believe the view. So now I'm going to break down, I want to break down the, the argument into three premises so we can think about them um, independently. Um, so the first premise says um, intuitive, it's intuitive that our um, experiences give us some justification for believing the things that we uh, believe on the basis of perception. So that's just a statement. The first premise just states what I was just trying to explain, that there's this uh, intuitive force behind the um, the the, do, the perceptual dogmatist's uh, thesis. Premise two says uh, that if something is intuitively plausible, then we have some reason to believe it. Uh, that's just a statement that's supposed to encapsulate the idea that intuitions have some epistemic value. That if you have that's, if something seems obviously true, then that's some kind of reason to believe that it's true. We'll come back to these premises to question them in a minute. So, okay, and premise three is that there's no intuitively obvious reason to reject the um, perceptual dogmatist principle. Okay, so premise one is the statement that the view is obvious in some intuitive sense. Statement two is that that fact gives us some reason to believe it, some good reason to believe it. Premise three is that there's no countervailing rationale for saying we shouldn't trust that uh, intuition. So I think, I, I guess I already sort of supported the first premise the best I can, the, trying to give the sense in which it is intuitive. Um, you might not think that it is intuitive, and if that's you, then, uh, then this argument doesn't do much for you. Um, there's a big, long conversation happening in the philosophy world about what are intuitions, uh, how could they be epistemically important. Um, and I think this is a place where it matters, because if you find two people, one of them who thinks it's an intuitive view, the other one who thinks it's not, it's very hard for them to decide what to do at that point, especially if they both think that intuitions matter. Um, you get this, this thing that happens sometimes where philosophers sort of have a battle of intuitions. They try to say, well, this is how it seems to me. Well, that's not how it seems to me. And this has led some philosophers even to do what they call experimental philosophy, which is go out and ask other people what their intuitions are. Um, and it's all very confusing uh, what the point of it all is. Um, so <clears throat> if you don't have the intuition, um, maybe you think it's a bad argument. It's tends to be the people who think it is a good intuition that like the view. And it might just be that, have, that thinking the intuition is good is more or less the same thing as, think, as liking the view. Um, so that's what I have to say about premise one. Premise two is this idea that um, if something is intuitively plausible, then it gives you some good uh, epistemic reason to accept the view. Um, this is a different premise from the first one. It's a general principle. It's not about the intuitiveness or the unintuitiveness of perceptual dogmatism itself. It's a, it's a question about intuitions. Do intuitions help? Um, do they give you reasons to believe? Um, for various different reasons, 
philosophers have thought uh, it's a good principle. Some people, like Descartes, have uh, a sort of explicit rationale for why intuition should be um, a source of knowledge and intellectual seeming. For Descartes, if you're thinking clearly and distinctly, you have the idea before your mind clearly and distinctly, um, then you can't be deceived about its content. You can sort of uh, tell in your mind's eye what the logical consequences of the concept are. Um, so part of classical epistemology has really, I think, been a, involved in treating intuitions or inner thought processes as a sort of uh, guide to the truth. Um, and I think be, to some extent, an intellectual historian might trace it to Descartes. I don't want to sort of argue historically that that's definitely where it comes from, but it's definitely in that tradition. Okay, so <clears throat> a, lot of, a lot of people have said a lot of things about that premise too. Um, another, another thing that people have said is um, we have to trust our intuitions somewhere along the line. It has to be true in some cases, um, or else we can't make any progress at all in philosophy because philo properly philosophical questions don't boil down to empirical evidence. They boil down to something else, something a priori, some kind of rational seeming, and we have to trust our, uh, our rational instincts in the domain of philosophical thought. Okay, that's basically, I, I don't know if I accept any of these arguments. I'm, I, just full disclosure, I'm more of an empiricist myself, and I don't necessarily see uh, where the rational force from an intellectual seeming is supposed to come from. Um, but that's just me. So, <clears throat> premise two, take it or leave it. <laughs> we're just, at this point, we're just uh, trying to ascertain whether or not we should be perceptual dogmatists. Um, I'll say why I think it's a good view, which is not really uh, the same argument. Why I like the view. Um, okay, but lastly, premise three is pretty open-ended. Premise three says um, that there are no good reasons to uh, reject um, perceptual dogmatism. That's kind of an open challenge to anybody who thinks it's a bad view. It's like, give me a reason why you think it's uh, intu unintuitive or unacceptable. And until someone produces that reason, the argument stands. Um, so to respond to the argument, one way to do it, um, as I've gone through, reject the claim that it's intuitively plausible, reject the claim that intuitions matter epistemically, that they give us some uh, hold on the truth, or number three, come up with some other consideration about why uh, there's a you know, good reason to disbelieve perceptual dogmatism. So now at that point, like premise three is basically knocking the ball back into the skeptic's court. And it's like, okay, skeptic, if you think something's wrong with this view, tell me what it is. Okay, so if you get those three principles, then you end up saying we've got good reason to believe that um, perceptual dogmatism is true. And so there you go. That's the argument for perceptual dogmatism. And then once you have that, you have some, uh, some tool to push back against the skeptic, stick up for more, and say we can trust our perceptual evidence that we've got hands. We're justified in believing that we have hands, even though we're not necessarily... Uh, justified in uh, ruling out that we're being deceived by a demon. I should add, actually, it's, it, you're not going to be able to push back against the skeptic who refuses to abandon the skeptical principle of justification. That would be to achieve the, um, the ambitious anti-skeptical project. The one that, that, uh, that Pryor is involved in, the, the modest anti-skeptical project, is just sort of convincing himself that... Um, convincing like-minded non-radical skeptics that they have some rationale for for backing up the Morian type uh, intuition or the Morian kind of perspective. Um, so, uh, so maybe the right way to put it is that it's it's more of it it's more about um, showing that Moore's argument is not question begging. So in that sense, it's on the skeptic to sort of defend their view without just saying, "Oh, Moore is begging the question," um, because Moore hasn't begged the question. He's sort of adopting a substantive um, view. He's got uh, apparently intuition on his side. So that's, that's where it leaves us. I'm, I'm talking to you from my porch where I'm editing the video and making my interjection. 
Okay, real quick, here's why I like the view. It's not that argument. And this isn't so far off of Pryor's uh, wavelength either. But I really like Moore's response to the skeptic, which says, um, I know that I have hands. I'm more certain in that claim than I am in any claim that the skeptic has to make. Um, and likewise, I want to say I'm more justified. I feel more certain that I'm justified in believing that I have hands then I feel certain that the skeptic's principal justification is true. So it seems to me like, I mean, I get the, I get the feeling that backs up the skeptic, that, that the skeptic uses this skeptical principle of justification, which has some intuitive appeal. Um, and I do feel the worry that the skeptic has. But at the same time, um, like more, I feel like it's more plausible, uh, or I'm more certain, that people can have justification on the basis of their sense experiences. Um, I think when push comes to shove, I think that people do know a lot about their environment and like what's going on. I think people are perceptive and that perception leads to knowledge. Perception provides justification. So with all that stuff in the background, to me, I, I'm looking for some explanation or other um, that would justify believing that we're justified in, in uh, trusting our senses in that way. So, so that's really why I, I think that perceptual dogmatism is a pretty decent view. I don't know if I ultimately deeply, deeply am committed to it, but I, it seems like a, a, a kind of nice answer to the skeptical challenge. So, yeah, that's where I'm at. Okay. Well, thanks for, um, paying close attention. This has been a complicated paper, four lectures later. Um, I hope you all have a sense of what's going on in this particular case, what the, what the debate is about, how it, how it is uh, articulated in, the, in this famous paper. And then I also hope that this has given you a sense of the kind of thing that goes on in 21st century philosophy. It gets more subtle, complex. Papers are dense with uh, points per page. <laughs> Things said uh, that need careful thought come quickly in the text. So, if you like thinking the way that this paper thinks, um, then you should read more epistemology in the classical tradition.